So reproductive isolation is pretty broad, um, but we're going to break it down into two main mechanisms. And this first mechanism of reproductive isolation is going to be entitled the following. So the rest of the flowchart, now that we have an establishment of what reproductive isolation is and what it's trying to prevent and why it's trying to prevent it, we're going to look at some more details. And the first type of reproductive isolation we need to understand is something called prezygotic. So that's a term, prezygotic mechanisms. And there are five of these prezygotic mechanisms. We'll go over um, about three in this video, and then we'll do the other ones in the next video. These prezygotic mechanisms to prevent reproduction, to isolate reproduction, are going to be there because they actually occur these mechanisms that prevent the zygote from forming, they occur before, and I said it already, before what event do you think? What do you think this occurs before? Prezygotic, before zygote formation. And this is critical. This is absolutely critical because right now what we're trying to do is prevent members of a different species from interbreeding and producing viable and fertile offspring because this is not going to happen. This is an imaginary situation that does not happen in nature. Now we're trying to ask ourselves, why doesn't it happen in nature? Why don't we see other species interbreeding with each other to try and produce viable and fertile offspring? Well, one of those reasons is because of reproductive isolation, and one type of reproductive isolation is known as prezygotic reproductive isolation mechanisms. Now, the key idea here is that because these occur before zygote formation, they actually also are going to uh, be direct indications of uh, prevention. Specifically, it prevents mating attempts from even happening. Okay, so this means that reproductive isolation um, may actually entirely prevent mating from happening because it's prezygotic. Okay, that means that mating is absolutely not going to happen for various numbers of, of reasons that we're going to be looking at. But let's say very, uh, let's say we do have a moment of uh, reproduction attempting or a moment of mating attempting. The whole idea here is overall we definitely, definitely, definitely want to prevent fertilization. That is the number one absolute overarching goal in prezygotic isolation mechanism is to prevent fertilization and a lot of the times that means that you prevent mating attempts altogether because you cannot have fertilization of egg and sperm if you do not have a mating attempt at all okay so let's look at some mechanisms this is a lot of actually interesting examples to look at and it's very very applicable it makes a lot of sense in terms of us and our study as humans when we look at these things you'll see what I mean when we get to some very contrived but fun to remember examples so let's think of a prezygotic mechanism one of them you have to understand is known as habitat isolation. So number one, there are five of them. I'll start labeling with number one. Habitat isolation is number one. This one is very, very easy to remember because it simply means the following. Two members of two different species will not mate because their habitats are isolated from one another. In essence, if you don't, okay, this basically means if you don't live in same area, if you don't live in same area, okay, so if you have one living on the continent of Asia and one living on the continent of Africa, and when I say one, I mean one species, if you don't live in the same area, you won't mate. Okay, you won't mate. And is that our goal right now? Our goal is to reproductively isolate species, and we're doing that. We're going to have speciation if there's habitat isolation. Things will differentiate from each other, will not uh, interbreed from each other, will not form hybrids, will not uh, establish gene flow if they don't live in the same area. In essence, I like to think of habitat isolation as a prezygotic mechanism. This is basically nature's way of saying long distance relationships absolutely cannot and will not and do not work in nature. And that's the basic idea behind habitat isolation. Moving forward, we have another type of isolation, and this one's also very, very fun to think about. Um, it's called temporal isolation. And these, again, are prezygotic, meaning that we do not have fertilization. We do not have the zygote forming. We do not have sperm and egg ever combining together. Look at this situation, habitat isolation. Do these two species that live in Africa and Asia ever have a chance to mate? Do they ever have a chance to fertilize each other's uh, sperm and egg? Absolutely not. Same idea will be seen in temporal isolation. Temporal isolation can be defined as the following. This is when a species uh, will undergo... Uh, breeding, so we're talking about two species right now, will undergo breeding, and temporal refers to time. So species undergo breeding, um, this is going to be specifically at different 
time. So that's the key to understanding temporal isolation, underlying different times. So they undergo breeding or mating events at different times. Best way to understand this is, of course, through a real-life example. So we're underneath this. We're going to extend our knowledge just a little bit, and we're going to put an example. Our example here will be something known as the dendrobium. Okay, what is a dendrobium? Well, a dendrobium, uh, I think it's dendrobium, B-I-U-M, um, is specifically a large genus, meaning that it's a group of uh, orchids. Okay, so there are different orchid species. Remember how we have genus and species in that binomial nomenclature? Well, in dendrobium, we have the genus of uh, several different orchids with several different species. So they're all under this classification of a dendrobium, but there are many different species. Why are there many different species? Why isn't everybody the same dendrobium? Why is this a genus and not a species? Why aren't we looking at all of the same orchids? Well, that's because of temporal isolation. Even though the dendrobium genus live, all of them live in the same forest, okay, this is, this is live in the same forest, so what um, type of isolation are we not definitely doing? We're definitely not doing habitat isolation, okay, so they live in the same forest, so they're definitely not isolated in terms of habitat, but, but even though they live in the same forest, they do not, and never, we never see this, they do not cross pollinate. And that's the idea that we're talking about up here. They don't interbreed, okay? They don't interbreed. The different species of the dendrobium a genus do not interbreed with each other. They do not cross-pollinate with each other. Well, now we have to ask ourselves, of course, as very curious biologists in the making, well, why not? Why wouldn't they interbreed with each other if they live in the same forest? What's stopping a uh, pollen from landing on a different dendrobium and uh, allowing for a fertilization event. Well, of course, we're going to prevent fertilization and prevent the mating attempts simply because, look at our, our definition of temporal isolation, species undergo breeding at different times. So the key idea here is that different orchids, okay, aka different species of these dendrobium orchids, let me write that one more time, different orchids, these different orchids, they actually flower. They open up the potential to mate. They open up the potential to mate at, what do you think? Different times, okay? At different times. So we're just trying to squeeze that in down here. Different orchids flower at different times. And not even that, but these flowering events also, we're going to add plus sign over here, are flowered for a very short period of time. So basically, we're looking at temporal isolation, time isolation. The timing is just not right with this relationship that we're seeing. Over here, if we have one person, this is the basic idea that imagine that you know you have a person who considers themselves a night person and a person who considers themselves a day person. Their ability to, let's say, mate or breed is going to be very, very difficult because they're doing, they're always, they're acting their specific ways at different times. We can always relate this back to humans. That's what I really like about this prezygotic mechanisms of reproductive isolation. So that's our temporal isolation. Good example is the dendrobium. The last thing that we'll talk about in this video, three out of five we'll cover, is a, a very fun one to really study. It's called behavioral um, uh, behavioral, let me rewrite that, number one, we'll say behavioral isolation. This is a very, very fun one to understand, and it actually makes a lot, a lot of sense. So, in behavioral isolation, we state the following, uh, and this is actually number three. We state the following in behavioral isolation. Behaviors are unique to a particular species. Okay, that's the basic definition that we have here, but we got to look at some examples. So we'll say behaviors are unique okay, to particular species. And how does this uh, affect prezygotic reproductive isolation? Well, let's see. Let's look at two very interesting examples. How are these two behaviors unique to a particular species? How do they prevent mating attempts? How do they prevent fertilization? Well, we're going to look at one classic example, which would be courtship rituals. These are very, very intuitive, very, very powerful uh, things that we can clearly observe, clearly observe as behavioral isolating mechanisms. Courtship rituals are simply, um, we can consider these just uh, the idea of attracting mates. This is when we attract mates. Think of courtship rituals as when we see uh, usually the male displaying a dance. Okay, so we'll say male displays, 
um, you know, X, Y, Z, a dance or its plumage or, you know, something of value, it seems, to the female. And the female is simply going to respond. The female responds. So male displays, female responds. What we're going to have is if the male doesn't display the right courtship, if the male doesn't do the right dance, if the male doesn't sing the right song, the female will not respond. The female will not allow for a mating attempt. The female will not allow for fertilization. This is behavior. If you do not have the correct song, if you do not have the correct dance as a bird, let's say, this behavior is going to isolate you from the female that is receptive, that the female that, that needs or wants this mating attempt to happen. And this is, of course, not going to happen if you cannot attract the mates with the proper um, behavior, with the proper dance, let's say, or with the proper song. So this idea is very, very cool. Courtship rituals. And lastly, and this one's very, very cool because uh, we see it all the time. Uh, fireflies display very unique behavioral isolation in the sense that fireflies, um, the males specifically, it's always males, they need to do these fancy things. Males, actually, you know, when you see fireflies flash their light, it's not random at all. These males actually need to blink in a particular pattern. This is crazy to think that this tiny little thing without a brain has this ability for the males themselves to that need to absolutely blink a particular pattern. Okay, they need to blink in a particular pattern for the females to respond. Again, this is the idea of male displays, female respond, for female uh, response. This is a very powerful uh, prezygotic mechanism. So overall, we've covered habitat isolation, temporal isolation, behavioral isolation, all of which are very, very interesting to see. Again, remember, it's all prezygotic. We do not have zygote formation because of, let's say, long distance, because of just the wrong time and because of just the wrong dance. So it's a very, very cool way to look at reproductive isolation. We'll continue this discussion as we move forward.